Hi there, welcome to another online sociology lesson. We are looking today at part two of our work on how crime is measured. So last lesson, we looked at this tip of the iceberg, the official statistics. We looked at the, the crime which is detected by people or the police, that which is reported to the police, and that which is recorded by the police as a crime. And we found out that really only a, a small minority of crimes that are ever committed end up becoming official statistics. So whilst we can really trust statistics with things like births and deaths and marriages and divorces, it's a lot more difficult to trust them when it comes to crime because there is such a great amount of crime that goes unnoticed. It goes undetected, unreported and unrecorded. And this is what makes up the dark figure of crime. All that crime, which is the bit of the iceberg beneath the surface that we never really get to see in statistics. OK, a stat that you can you can take home from this lesson is that four out of 10 on average of crimes that are committed are reported to the police and recorded by the police. That's four out of 10, which means six out of 10 crimes or 60 out of 100 go unnoticed and unreported and unrecorded, which means that the dark figure of crime is actually larger than the crimes which we see in the official statistics. And this is why today's lesson is so important and this is why victim surveys and self-report studies are used by sociologists to try and get a better picture because what we can do is we can use victim surveys and self-report studies to try and uncover a bit more of this dark figure of crime so if we have the official statistics that we've already got from the government and then we take it a step further and we ask victims or people if they have been victims of crime. And then we ask people if they themselves have committed a crime. Then we can use both of those data plus the official statistics to get a better understanding of what is happening in our country regarding crime. OK, and we're going to look at both of these today. We're going to look at what they are, how they're used and the advantages and disadvantages of both of them. Okay, it's a great lesson today and you're going to get well involved um, with your own research as well. So to start with, we're going to look at victim surveys. So put a little subtitle down underneath your title, victim surveys. We're going to use the iceberg analogy throughout because I really want to hammer that home. It's a really helpful analogy to use when looking at the data on crime. So if I just explain briefly what these are, and then I'm going to get you to do a bit of research yourself using a victim survey. So they are large scale surveys of the population, roughly 50,000 people at a time, where people are interviewed or where they are sent a survey to fill out themselves. And they are asked which crimes have been committed against them. So where they have been a victim in a given time period commonly 12 months okay now the most common one the one that we're going to use as our kind of basis for victim surveys is it used to be called the british crime survey and it's now called the crime survey for england and wales or the csew now this is conducted by the government and it includes a sample of around 50 thousand people in england and wales every year now this tells us that the government are fully aware that the official statistics are not enough because the government is submitting another survey to get more data on crime and what's happening in our country so they know that the police records only are the minority of all crimes remember four out of ten crimes are reported to the police and even maybe less of those end up being recorded because the police don't record all the things that they're reported as crimes. So 
the CSEW includes crimes which have not been reported to the police and therefore lets us understand a little bit more about this dark figure of crime. There might be certain crimes which someone never actually reported to the police for whatever reason, maybe they forgot or they didn't um, have time or they were scared or they didn't think the police cared enough or didn't have the enough resources to help them but they still report this later to the CSEW. That still that helps us understand the crimes which have gone unreported and unrecorded. It helps us with the dark figure of crime. So if you need to make these notes, if you need to, to finish jotting this down, pause the video before we move on. So I'm going to move on to the next slide now. So pause it and come and join me when you're ready. So some examples of victim survey questions. This is a very basic example. There is much more detailed ones that we would probably be using when it comes to the actual CSEW. Um, but this is a great example. In the past 12 months, have you been a victim of? And you can tick if it's yes or no. OK, so robbery, fraud, violent crime, hate crime. Now, part of the issue with this is that some of us might you know, define different things differently. So it's helpful to have a definition in place. But remember, four out of 10 crimes are reported to the police, six out of 10 are not. So you might have been a victim of hate crime on the streets. Maybe you were walking down the road and someone shouted something at you that was targeting your race or your gender or your religion or your sexuality. Um, it's a hate crime, it's illegal. But that person walked off and you didn't get to see who they were. So there's no point really for you. Unfortunately, you might feel like there's no point you submit you recording that to the police because you didn't see them. You didn't know what they looked like. So you know that if you report it to the police, they're not going to do anything about it because you can't describe the person who who committed the hate crime against you. However, you know you were still a victim of that hate crime. So when the survey comes around, you can say, yes, I was a victim of the hate crime. I have been a victim of a hate crime in the last 12 months. So that is another crime which we can add to our data on crime that we've already got. OK, so it's crimes which have not already been reported are added into the CSEW. So you get both working together to get a bigger picture. So on Show My Homework um, and in the bio, I have included a link for the CSEW for the Crime Survey for England and Wales. I want you to follow that link and that will take you all the way to the most recent publication, which actually was published in April of this year, okay, 2020. And it shows all of the crime that has been reported in this victim survey from January to December of 2019. Okay, so it's super up to date. I'd like you to use this and I'd like you to write down one type of crime that has increased, gone up, and one type of crime that has decreased, gone down since 2018. Okay, and this report will tell you that. I've checked it, it's there. So subtitle, under your subtitle, um, CSEW, and write, write out what it is, what it stands for. And then I want you to um, explain the 2020 data, what's gone up and what's fallen. Remember, this is victims, people telling you what they have and haven't been a victim of. So really, really important data. Once you've done that, move on to the next slide, but pause this video whilst you go away and get all the research you need to get done. OK, once you've done that, have a think about this. I want you to draw this table in your book. Now, it's really, really important that you understand the advantages and the disadvantages of every research method we look at. And we've looked at surveys back in year nine. OK, so you do know the general advantages of surveys. Remember, surveys are when I send something out to a lot of people and they can fill it in in their own time. So I'm not there looking over them. So you might argue that creates more validity because they can fill in what they really think. You could also argue it creates less validity because they might be more free to lie. Now, I want you to think about not just surveys in general, but surveys specifically for people who are victims of crime. OK, what might be the advantages 
of a victim survey and what might be the disadvantages of a victim survey. Now, think of a couple, see what you can get down. I will give you some answers in a second, but I want you to think before you move forwards. All right, don't just copy blindly from the screen. That's not gonna help you really learn this, really understand it, okay? If you were given a survey where you were asked, have you been a victim of these crimes? What are some of the good things about that survey? What does it allow me as the sociologist to, to find out, to realize, link that to the iceberg and the dark figure of crime? But also what might happen? How, as a victim of crime, how might that survey trigger you? How might you, um, what might your memory be like of the crimes that were committed to you? Are you even aware of the crimes that are being committed to you? Is a victim survey flawless or does it have some disadvantages? Okay, pause this video, have a think, jot some things down and I'll go over the answers in a second. Okay, pause it now for me. Okay, here we go. Here are the answers. If, you, if you've got anything resembling this, well done. If you haven't, I will talk through all of them and I'll explain why they are advantages and why they are disadvantages. Let's start on the left-hand side, advantages. To start with, obviously, they are going to help us uncover some of that dark figure of crime. I'm going to say the stat again. Four out of ten crimes are reported to the police. That's only 40%, 60% go unreported. Even more than that go unrecorded. Even more than that end up going to court and going to trial. Okay, most crimes do not end up in court. Most criminals do not end up being reported to the police. So anything we can do, a victim survey is one of those things, to help us uncover the dark figure, the 60% that goes unreported, is really, really helpful. Okay, so on a specific sense, this is one of the massive, massive advantages of victim surveys. They uncover that dark figure of crime. They give us a bit more of an accurate figure of crime than just using official statistics because combined with statistics, we can combine the victim surveys and the stats to build that bigger picture up and therefore get a bigger understanding, a better understanding of what's happening in our society. You could also say on a more kind of basic level, not specifically victim surveys, but surveys in general, they are practical because they are time efficient, they're cost efficient and they're easy access. Um, and they are also, depending on the size of the sample, they are also representative because you can get a large sample across the whole of England and Wales, um, such as the CSEW, which is 50,000 people. Um, and they are also reliable because they are quantitative data. They are a survey, just tick boxes. You can easily repeat that survey year on, year out and measure the trends and patterns over time. OK, so they that's the kind of the basic reasons why they're helpful. But focus as much as you can on the specifics of a victim survey rather than just a survey itself. On the right hand side, the, the disadvantages of victim surveys. To start with, it doesn't survey all crime. OK, so you wouldn't send a victim survey out for a crime against a business because there's no kind of one person who's been a victim in that. So if I were to commit a crime against an international corporation, let's say, um, I, I don't know, I robbed Starbucks, maybe, of all of their coffee, because I was desperate for some coffee. No one person's a victim there. So if the, if, if the CSW sent out a, a survey to everyone in Great Britain, everyone in England and Wales, there's no one person who would say, yes, I've been a victim of this crime because it, it kind of affected a whole business rather than a single person. So it doesn't it, it doesn't really help that kind of crime. It also we can't survey things like victimless crime, like graffiti. If you drew a graffiti on a wall, 
no one is really a victim of that. I'm not saying it's okay and someone's got to clean it up. So ultimately there is some kind of victim, but it's not targeting anyone in particular. Okay, so victim surveys are really helpful at us targeting crimes which target people, so so one-on-one -on -one crime, but not so helpful at crimes that have no victims or have multiple victims, i.e. a business kind of crime. Secondly, even though we give people the chance to do so, not everyone feels comfortable admitting to being a victim of some crime. So things like violent assault or rape are really, really traumatic um, and, and difficult experiences to go through. And admitting to being a victim of that can be really, really challenging. So even though there is this thing in place, not everyone chooses to admit to being a victim of crime. OK, so therefore we still might be getting a dark figure of crime, even in victim surveys, because not every crime that's happened is revealed in a victim survey. Thirdly, a victim memory of crime might be some kind of inaccuracy. So if if I'm surveying you in January of this year and I'm asking you in the last 12 months, have you been a victim of any of these crimes? It might have happened back in January of last year, so a whole year ago. And your memory of the event might be somewhat hazy based on time that's passed or trauma. Um, and therefore, you might not give a valid account. OK, and that might rend some of the data that you give invalid and therefore we might not be able to trust fully what is in these victim surveys. And finally, not everyone's aware that they're ever a victim of a crime. So something might happen to you. You might be caught up in something and you might not be aware that actually that was a criminal offence. It might seem quite minor um, and therefore you don't report it because you're just you're just ignorant of it actually being a crime in the first place. OK, so there's all the reasons why we can absolutely use victim surveys. But we have to be mindful that even victim surveys don't reveal all crimes for those reasons listed there. OK, right. We're going to move on to looking at self-report studies where people are asked to admit to crimes that they have committed. So here we go. Self-report studies. As I've said, they ask people to reveal crimes that they've committed, and if they have committed a crime, how often they've committed that crime. Okay, so it asks you to be very, very honest. Now, they include both criminal and deviant acts. So stealing from a shop is obviously criminal, but they also include deviant acts such as riding a bicycle without lights or riding on the pavement, which, yes, is criminal. But it's, it's one of those things which is probably seen more as deviant because it's, it's a very minor offence, you know, that kind of stuff. And basically, it's again, it's a survey where it goes around. It's anonymous and you tick all the things that you have done during that time period. The reason it's anonymous is really, really obvious. It's because we're not doing these studies to, to catch people out, to get them in trouble, to put them in jail. It's to build up a picture of this dark figure of crime. So we have to make sure people are free to admit the crimes they have committed. If we said to them, give your name, give your address, and then tell me all the crimes you committed, they're not going to say anything because people aren't stupid. We have to make it anonymous so that we're more likely to build up that rapport and get that data that we really, really want. I'm going to say that again. Four out of ten crimes are reported to the police. This is an opportunity for the 60% to be admitted. It's not going to go to the police. It's not going to end up as a, as a statistic in the government, but it allows sociologists to find out what's actually going on. And self-report studies have proven over time that criminal activity is much more common than the statistics suggest. Let's say the statistics say that 100 people have um, had a, a speeding offence in the last month. You send out a report study to 500 people and 300 of them admit to having sped in their car. That's already 200 more than the stats said. And that's just a small sample of people. OK, so these are a great way of really finding out what people have and haven't done. Now, on SurveyMonkey, I have put a self-report study up. I have put up a report study for you to fill in. 
Now I need you to do this honestly, please do not lie, okay? Please do not exaggerate what you have done or hide what you haven't. It is all anonymous. No one is gonna get in any trouble for admitting any of these things. And I need you to not leave your name and make sure it's anonymous, but I really want you to get to, to see what these are all about. And I will, I will compare this data and I will um, show you the results next lesson. But this is a great chance for you to see what the kind of the format of the self report study looks like um, and to see that kind of dark figure of crime in action. Now, once you've done that, I want you to come to this part of the lesson, which is the advantages and disadvantages of self-report studies. Same as the, the, the victim surveys, think about them specifically. Think about them in relation to self-report studies rather than just surveys in general, okay? Some of the advantages and the disadvantages are similar to the last ones, and therefore you might want to use those as a kind of guiding point to start with. Once again, pause the video, have a think, write some stuff down that you can think of, and then come back once you've had a real good go at it and look at the answers that I have provided. Okay, so pause it now and then come back. Okay, here we go. On the left-hand side, self-report studies will again help us uncover that dark figure of crime. We've gone over that. That's, that's pretty obvious. Yeah, we should all have got that one. Number two, it is, it is possible to also, from this, find out a hidden offender's class, age, gender, and ethnicity. That's cage factors, yeah, class, age, gender, ethnicity, and even their location. Now, this is, again, it's anonymous, but you might say in a, in a self-report study, can you please identify if you are male, female, other? Can you please identify if you are white, black, etc etc um, please identify your income bracket and your uh, your age bracket um, and even your location not like the road you live on but maybe the area so Surrey or South London or Yorkshire or Cornwall so sociologists can begin to build up a pattern which remains anonymous to the to the actual people that committed the crimes but we get to see a trend in criminal behavior so if I send out this study to 400 people and of that 400 i get 350 responses back and of those 350 i see that 70 percent of those that said yes they had committed a crime were male then i get to see some kind of trend that maybe crime is more common amongst men than women Okay, so it's a great way of sociologists seeing trends and patterns in criminal activity. It's also a really good way, thinking of to the disadvantages of victim surveys, it's a really good way of finding out about that victimless crime. Okay, so things like graffiti. I can ask you, have you graffitied on a wall in the last 12 months? You can say yes or no. And that's the only way I'm going to ever find that out because it's victimless and it goes unreported. Drug use is another example that is often used. I personally would argue that drug use is full of victims because you've got those that are uh, running the drugs and making them. And it's, it's, it's a hugely victim based um, uh, crime. But a lot of sociologists would argue that it is victimless. So therefore, I've included it in this one on the right hand side. The disadvantages of self-report studies, again, it's pretty obvious. People can lie. People can lie about what they have and haven't done. Some people might lie about what they haven't done because they want to um, maybe suggest that they've done less crimes and they want to sort of appear a better person. Some people think, well, it's anonymous. No one's ever going to find out. Let's have a bit of fun. And they admit to doing all the crimes and they've done none of them, but they just think it's funny to admit to things they haven't done. Um, Either way, it's invalid data. If you get any responses which are lies, the, the data is invalid. The issue is that you don't know if it's a lie or not. So you might get 350 responses and all of them are lies, but you would never know that as a sociologist. So the only way for you to really understand it is to measure the responses you get this year against the ones you got last year and the year before and see if they fit in line with those trends and patterns. Okay, that's the only way that you'd really be able to work it out. 
Um, second point on the right hand side, most self-report studies are carried out on young people and students. There are no surveys like this on professional criminals. You know, we don't get in touch with international arms dealers and go, have you committed a crime in the last 12 months? Their entire existence is criminal. Their entire livelihood is based on crime. There's no surveys for those people. It's basically petty crimes, trivial crimes, sort of, you know, thieving from a shop, that kind of stuff. Which brings one to our final disadvantage, and this is quite an important one. The majority of crimes that are revealed in self-report studies are trivial. Things that like a petty crime, so nicking sweets from a shop, um, speeding in your car, graffiti on a wall, that kind of stuff. Because it's anonymous. People, Even though it's anonymous, people don't really want to admit to committing more serious crimes like assault or murder. People don't really want to admit to that if they have done it, even if they're told it's anonymous, because it's better for them just to say, no, I'm not anything, because they don't want to get in any trouble eventually. So what you get with this is, although it's a disadvantage, because you're still not getting all the information on all the crimes that are out there, it's also quite helpful to pair these with statistics, because statistics often target the more serious crimes the assaults, the murders, the, 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 the big robberies, the thefts, the drug use, the, the rapes, that kind of stuff. These self-report studies are a great way of seeing the other crimes, the more petty ones, the more trivial ones. Combine the two together with victim surveys and you have a really good picture of what's happening in society. Okay, right, we're going to move on to the final task. Before I move you on, um, you might be sitting here asking this question. Why does it matter? Why do sociologists need to know what crimes are being committed? Can't we just investigate other stuff instead? Well, ultimately, if we don't know what's being committed, we can't know who is committing them. And remember, sociology is all about looking at the people in society and why people behave in the way that they do. If we don't know what crime is being committed, we don't know who's committing them. We have to find out what crime is going on to then be able to link the crime to the person and find out why are more men committing crimes than women, etc, etc, etc. Because we want to understand trends and patterns. We want to see whether or not poorer people um, commit more crimes than richer people men more so than women, etc, etc. We want to see what these trends are. And the only way to do this is to get accurate data on crime, which then allows us to build an accurate picture of criminal behaviour. OK, right. Final task. And if this has taken you at this point to the hour, then stop here and do this next task next lesson. But if you've still got time, it should take you about five to ten minutes and here it is i would like you to have a look at this table you can print it if you can screenshot it or just copy it out into your book but have a think about how pervy the three ways of measuring crime are so you've got official statistics victim surveys and self-report studies and you've got practical ethical reliable representative and valid now i've done one example for you in each column and I've done it out of 10. OK, so I've said that official statistics are a 10 out of 10 of practicality, um, but they're only a 4 out of 10 for validity. Victim surveys are a 7 out of 10 for ethics and a 9 out of 10 for representativeness. And self-report studies are a 10 out of 10 for reliability. Hint on that one, all of them are very reliable, OK, because they are all quantitative data. So out of 10, score each way of measuring crime for each column and just write a little reason as to why you gave that score all right if you've got any questions you know where to find me i've been really impressed with your work so far please keep it up keep working hard and i look forward to seeing what you submit have a lovely day